Today's online session will focus on hospital practices that hinder breastfeeding. By the end of this online module, students will be able to describe at least five hospital practices that may hinder breastfeeding. So in particular, we're gonna focus on, at least today, with respect to hindering breastfeeding, hospital practices that occur during labor, delivery in the postpartum period. In general, over um, the next modules, you may have noticed we have two modules that focus on hospital settings. One that focuses on practices that hinder practices that support breastfeeding. And the reason for that is that we really, the, the hospital setting has a huge impact on breastfeeding. And so um, I'm gonna spend a little time before I get into the specific uh, practices that hinder breastfeeding, talking a little bit about the significance of the hospital setting. So first, here's a great quote that really summarizes it. The first few hours and days of a newborn's life are a critical window for establishing lactation and providing mothers with the support they need to breastfeed successfully. So, you know, when we're talking about breastfeeding and the hospital setting, Kind of a rhetorical question, can hospital practices influence breastfeeding? Yes, and again, that's why we're spending two full modules on the hospital setting. Let's talk a little bit about what it is about the hospital stay that is so critical to getting breastfeeding off to either a good or ineffective start. So in the hospital period, that's really the learning period for a new breastfeeding mom and a new breastfeeding baby. So depending on the birth the mom has, she's gonna spend anywhere between 24 to four days postpartum in the hospital. So if you have a mom who is delivering vaginally, she's going to, her average length of stay is gonna be anywhere between 24 hours to 48 hours. A mother who delivers via C-section, she's going to go home between three to four days. So either way, those are still really early um, on in that mother baby diet and breastfeeding experience. This is where moms are initiating breastfeeding. This is where moms are working towards establishing breastfeeding. And it can be a pretty challenging time. And it's also when we are um, the critical period with respect to establishing milk supply. So let's go back a little bit to our lecture on the science of lactation. So as you may recall, Lactogenesis 1 and lactogenesis 2 are hormonally driven, meaning when a mom gets pregnant, her body starts to make colostrum during her pregnancy. She gives birth, her placenta is delivered, her body says, okay, baby's here, got to make that mature milk. But the only way for her to establish her milk supply, to make enough for that new baby, is if her baby is eating frequently and effectively. This critical period begins in the hospital stay. This is where the mom and baby are learning to breastfeed. Even if we have a mother who is a third time mother who breastfed her first two babies beautifully, baby number three comes along, didn't read the book, doesn't know what he's doing, she's struggling. It's in the hospital stay that she's going to be struggling. And so it's really what's going on in that hospital period and that hospital stay that's really going to either hinder her breastfeeding or support her so she's successful. So when we talk about the hospital period, today we're gonna to focus on those practices that can make it much more difficult for moms to breastfeed, things like epidurals, Pitocin, um, different medical interventions. And some people might say, well, you know what? There's all these medical interventions in the hospital period. Why don't moms just give birth at home? Can't they do that? And the answer is yes, they can. However, in reality, most women in the United States do not give birth in the hospital. They, um, you know, why don't you, let's just take a guess. If you were to pick a percentage, a number of moms that you think actually choose to give birth at home or outside the hospital setting, like in a birthing center, how many do you think it is? Very little, yes, it's 1.5%. So really, you can see that, as I mentioned, the majority of the women who give birth in the U.S., that's like 98.5% of them are giving birth in the hospital. So if you're going to be promoting breastfeeding in the community, most of the women and the families you work with, they're going to be giving birth in the hospital. And advocating for hospital practices that promote breastfeeding 
is going to make a huge difference in how successful um, breastfeeding is for these families. I'm going to touch on a few initiatives that focus on the hospital setting. Again, recognizing how much of an impact hospital practices can have on breastfeeding. There are several global, national, and even local breastfeeding promotion initiatives that have um, been developed to optimize practices in the hospital setting. So first, starting with the baby-friendly hospital initiative. This is a big one. I touched on it a little bit in a prior lecture, and we're gonna go into really significant details up in um, our next online lecture on hospital practices that support breastfeeding. So in, in general, the Baby-Friendly Hospital Initiative is an initiative that focuses on getting hospitals to adopt policies with 10 steps that promote breastfeeding. Another initiative, which is on the national level in the United States, is one of our Healthy People 220 objectives. And um, you may recall, we talked about the different Healthy People 220 objectives, and one of them focuses specifically on the hospital setting and addressing the barriers that poor practices in a hospital setting have on breastfeeding. And so that specific objective is to increase the proportion of live births that occur at facilities that provide recommended care for lactating mothers and their babies. And what they're really talking about is birthing centers, hospitals, wherever maternity centers where moms are giving birth, that they actually are either baby friendly or they promote very similar practices as the 10 steps that actually make it easier for moms to breastfeed. In California, um, we also have an initiative focused on the hospital setting and the California Health and Safety Code that was adopted a while back actually focuses on requiring by January 1st, 2025, all hospitals in California to have in place either the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding or an alternative policy, which is something called the model hospital policy. And really, if you were to read this model hospital policy, it's very similar to the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. So all these three initiatives on the slide, the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, which is a global initiative, Healthy People 220 National, and then we've got the California Health and Safety Code. All of these initiatives all focuses on getting hospitals to adopt those steps that promote breastfeeding that are associated with more successful breastfeeding. Again, we'll go into detail with what those are um, in the next session. Another thing I want to mention in terms of the hospital setting, in terms of its significance, is that because the hospital setting is so significant in terms of how successful a mom is breastfeeding, lactation professionals really look at this particular time period. So in respect to the lactation consultant, if you're a lactation consultant and you're working with a mother-baby diet who's having some difficulty breastfeeding, when um, one of the first things you're gonna do when they come in for that consult is ask that mom questions about um, her labor, delivery, and postpartum experience. You're gonna try to find out what kinds of interventions were used, and these will give you clues as to uh, if this baby's breastfeeding challenges have to do with some of these interventions or something else. Lactation educators also focus on that hospital period. They do it more proactively with respect to providing breast mo pregnant moms and their families with information about the relationship between hospital practices and breastfeeding. So oftentimes in a prenatal breastfeeding class or a labor and delivery class, the educator will touch on the different interventions that are used during labor, delivery, and the postpartum period and how they might impact breastfeeding. This way moms can make educated and informed decisions about whether or not those um, interventions are things that they want to uh, have. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So the assignment before class was hospital practices and breastfeeding assignment, which focused specifically on you going through and describing the rationale for several interventions used during labor, delivery, and the postpartum period, and then also how they specifically impact breastfeeding duration rate. Before we get into that and we and to go into each of these interventions, 
i want to mention number one that the purpose of this assignment and this discussion is not to bash hospitals and say oh hospitals are horrible they use all these interventions during labor delivery in the postpartum period that are horrendous and they negatively impact breastfeeding no on the contrary the reason for this discussion is for you to be very familiar um, familiar enough so that you can educate families in the community about these interventions, what the reason is for them. There is always going to be a medical reason for these interventions. However, sometimes the um, rationale for utilizing one of these interventions is not medical. And under those circumstances, it would be really important for a mom and her significant other, her family members to know how these interventions can negatively impact breastfeeding. And so, for example, one intervention that's used during labor is induction. Sometimes women's labor is induced. Maybe there's a concern about the mom's health, the baby, maybe both. Under those circumstances, if there's a concern for mom and baby's health and the doctor decides to uh, go ahead and induce that labor to protect the mother and baby's health, that's definitely a medical, valid medical reason. On the other hand, if the doctor says, you know, I'd like to induce you this weekend because I'm going on vacation next week, that's not a valid medical reason. And it's really important under those circumstances that the mother and her family members understand how induction can impact breastfeeding or other things as well. So that's the purpose of this discussion. We're going to go through interventions that occur during labor, delivery, and then the postpartum period, why they're used, and then how they impact breastfeeding initiation and duration rates. First, we're going to start with those interventions used during labor and breastfeeding. And so particularly, we're talking about Pitocin, analgesia, and anesthesia. Let's talk first about Pitocin, why it's used, and how does it influence breastfeeding. So take a moment, and I want you to take a look at your, refresh your memory, look at your assignment. Why is Pitocin used? That's right. It's used to induce labor. So sometimes a mom is overdue. Maybe uh, she's 42 weeks pregnant, and the doctor would like to induce labor. The uterine environment is intended to be the home of that baby for about 40 weeks. So by 42 weeks, that's not the most optimal environment. Sometimes the amniotic fluid may be low. Um, there may be some, it's just, it's about time. So Pitocin may be used to induce labor. On the other hand as well, um, sometimes um, a mom's bags of water break. You may have heard my water broke. Um, and that's when there's either a leak or a, a complete tear in the amniotic sac and then the, the fluid either is going to be very low or is starting to be low. When a mom's membranes rupture, there's a concern of infection and infection is, is a serious concern for an infant that has not, a fetus that has not been delivered. So typically moms are put on this 24 hour clock that if they don't deliver, they, they pretty much want that baby out by 24 hours. So if nothing's happening, there's no contractions, then Pitocin may be used under those circumstances. So those are some medical reasons why Pitocin is used. And we talked earlier about some non-medical reasons like early induction because doctor wants to go on vacation. Either way, let's talk a little bit about how Pitocin impacts breastfeeding. Does anyone know? Do you know? That's right. When moms have Pitocin during labor, what happens is it causes edema in the extremities. So your extremities are your feet, your hand, and also your nipples. Edema or swelling in the nipples can make breastfeeding extremely difficult. If you imagine a balloon, like that you're blowing up, you're blowing air in it, you're blowing air in it, and as that balloon is getting more and more full with air, there's that like tiny little piece at the end of the balloon resembles a nipple. As you blow more and more air, what happens to that nipple? That's right, it disappears completely. It's flat, there is no nipple. That's what happens with edema or swelling. If I've got swelling in the nipples and I, or in my breast, 
and nipple area, it's going to make my nipple essentially disappear and make it extremely difficult for a baby to breastfeed because that nipple is essentially disappears. Now let's talk about another intervention used during um, labor, analgesia. What's analgesia? That's right. It's basically used commonly during labor to relieve pain. Very common for moms to experience pain during labor. And analgesia will, will be used, it's administered through an IV and it can help reduce pain. Typically it's given during early um, labor. And so um, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, labor, essentially labor or and birth is divided into two stages. Stage one is the period of time when mom uh, is in labor and her um, she has contractions and her cervix is going to dilate from zero to ten. Once her cervix reaches, reaches ten, she can push that baby out and that's called stage two. Now, during stage one of labor, we, we divide it up into early and late. Early it, you, stages of labor usually take longer and that's when the cervix dilates from zero to four. Now, I'm talking textbook. Every labor is different, but in a textbook labor, we're usually going to see that the mom's progression of her cervix dilating is very slow from zero to four. Once she reaches four centimeters, it's common that her cervix dilates much quicker. Because anesthesia, like an epidural, can really slow down labor, oftentimes the preference is to give analgesia to relieve pain in the earlier parts of labor because we don't want to give the epidural too soon. So why is it used? It's used to relieve pain. And how does it affect breastfeeding? That's right. It actually impacts the newborn's sucking reflexes. So it can make them kind of dorked out. If you think about if you've ever had analgesia, it kind of makes you groggy and tired. It does the same thing to baby and groggy, tired babies don't have their natural reflex intact. And so they can be really tired and tired makes it much more difficult to breastfeed. Now let's talk a little bit about anesthesia and breastfeeding. Why is anesthesia administered? Well, just like analgesia to reduce pain. It, there's two main ways or common ways that anesthesia is administered. One is an epidural is a spinal. With an epidural, you can see on the slide, the catheter is inserted right where the epidural space is, and the anesthesia is administered that way. And with a spinal, the catheter is inserted right where the cerebrospinal fluid is. Um, both um, methods of administering anesthesia will numb the mom from the waist down, Epidurals take a lot longer to start acting, where spinal is immediate. Typically, spinals are going to be used for a C-section, either scheduled or emergency, because they want to get in, take the baby out pretty quickly, where an epidural is going to be there for until the a lot longer. Now, when we talk about anesthesia and its impact on breastfeeding, it's dose-related. And so, what I mean by that is that the longer that or the more anesthesia the mom gets, the more of an impact it has on her and baby. So typically spinals in place for a very short period of time because it's used for a C-section. They prep the mom, catheters inserted into the cerebrospinal fluid. Five, 10 minutes later, baby's delivered and that's it. Sew the mom up, but with an epidural, it can be in place for a very long time, depending on how long the mom is laboring and if she asks for um, more. So it is uh, administered with a catheter and, then, and you can easily uh, add more. So if mom's been laboring for eight hours, she asks for an epidural and it's been in place for eight hours and she's still in labor, she can ask for an additional dose to be um, added. Um, let's, so let's talk a little bit about how um, epidurals impact breastfeeding specifically. So um, how do they impact breastfeeding? I'm going to pause for a moment so you can refresh your memory, take a look at your assignment. 
so number one, when moms have an epidural, what it does is it numbs them from the waist down. And what happens once mom is at 10 centimeters, what does she have to do? That's right, she has to push the baby out. So if she's numb from the waist down, it's going to be a little difficult for her to push baby out. And sometimes what happens is that she needs a little help. And so she's going to need to have what, uh, assistance with either forceps or vacuum. And when we're going to talk shortly about forceps and vacuum, so I won't talk about the consequences of breastfeeding from use of forceps and vacuum. The other uh, impact of epidurals is that oftentimes moms who have an epidural will um, get a fever. And under those circumstances, there's a concern that baby might have some sort of infection as well. So automatically what happens is baby's going to get um, preventative antibiotics. Now, does anyone know how antibiotics are administered to an infant? Mm -hmm. Through an IV and typically in a special care nursery or a NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit. So um, anyone know how long the average amount of an um, antibiotics we're going to have to give a baby that we're concerned has an infection? Just like adults, about seven to 10 days. So by seven to 10 days, that mom's already gone home and guess where baby is? You got it. They're in either a special care nursery or the neonatal um, intensive care unit. And there's some separation between mom and baby. Mom goes home, baby stays in the NICU. And if she wants to breastfeed, she's going to have to either come to the NICU and do so, or she's going to have to express her breast milk and bring it to baby. It makes it much more difficult to breastfeed. Another um, consequence potentially of an epidural is what we call um, failure to progress. Epidurals can slow down labor and that's actually why typically um, doctors don't like to give an epidural till mom's at least at four centimeters because if it's given too early and things slow down, the mom may never get to 10 centimeters and then that means automatic c-section so just again another potential consequence of an epidural is that that mom's going to end up with a c-section also just like with analgesia anesthesia can affect newborn sucking reflexes so when a baby has either an epidural or spinal they're getting anesthesia and it can affect their sucking uh, reflexes however with a spinal it's typically not going to be very impactful because they are only getting about five, 10 minutes worth of anesthesia. On the other hand, with an epidural, it could be eight hours, 10 hours, and when that mom, if that baby is born, they're gonna be very, very sleepy. Now, I can tell you that epidurals can make babies sleepy, and this can make it more difficult to breastfeed, but if you watch this video, which I'm gonna show you shortly, you're gonna see it for yourself and it's much more convincing than me telling you about it. And basically, um, this short five minute video is showing you the results of a study done by Dr. Reinhardt back in 1999. And what he found was that when moms have a medicated birth, meaning when they have an epidural, especially if it's in place for a long time, it significantly impacts those newborn reflexes. We know that the newborn reflexes can actually help a baby self-attach to the breast. They can crawl up by themselves and start to suckle at the breast. But if they're medicated, then those newborn reflexes are negatively impacted and they, they're, you know, they're really sleepy and they're not going to crawl up to the breast. So let's pause for a moment and we'll watch that short five minute clip that shows this more beautifully than me talking about. 
Can Alex assess your knowledge about how hospital practices used during labor impact breastfeeding? Which of the following describes the impact that anesthesia administered to the laboring mother may have on breastfeeding? A, edema in the extremities, including the breast and nipple tissue. B, impaired sucking. C, breast aversion. Or D, a baby that's uncomfortable breastfeeding in certain positions. That's right, impaired sucking. What about this one? Which of the following describes the impact that Pitocin may have on breastfeeding? A, edema in extremities, including the breast and nipple tissue. B, impaired sucking. C, breast aversion. Or D, a baby who's uncomfortable breastfeeding in certain positions. That's correct. Edema in extremities, including the breast and nipple tissue. Now let's talk about interventions used during delivery. So remember delivery is when the mom is pushing the baby out. Once she reaches 10 centimeters, she's in stage two, time to push the baby out. However, sometimes there's mom is too exhausted or there's some other circumstances where she needs assistance. And under those circumstances, mechanical devices would be used. And the two devices commonly used are forceps and vacuum extraction. So why are they used? I just told you, to help deliver the baby. Now how can they impact breastfeeding? Well, how can mechanical devices impact breastfeeding? Well, if a mom can't push baby out and a mechanical device needs to be used, sometimes there's an injury to the head. The baby may have a bruise or they just might have a less severe injury. But in any case, a baby who has a head injury, mild or not, is going to be uncomfortable breastfeeding in certain positions. And babies who are uncomfortable and fussy are very challenging to breastfeed. If there is some bruising, that puts them at a risk of jaundice. And we're not going to go into a lot of details right now about jaundice. We'll cover that um, in the second lactation class, lactation education in the postpartum period. For right now, what I want you to know is that if there is bruising, then that puts the baby at a higher risk of jaundice, and jaundice makes babies sleepy. Sleepy babies are very difficult to breastfeeding, and so that's how it impacts breastfeeding. Now let's talk about hospital practices used during the postpartum period and breastfeeding. We're going to talk about suctioning, weighing, measuring, and bathing the baby immediately after birth, and also placing the baby in a warmer. So why are babies suctioned? That's right, there's a lot of amniotic fluid that is left on board. The baby's been in utero for nine months, swallowing, drinking amniotic fluid. So there's a lot of it when they're born, particularly with C-section babies, they, that amniotic fluid needs to be removed and it's, suctions are used to do so from the nose and the mouth. Now, if the baby is vaginally delivered, a lot of times more of that um, fluid is removed because they're getting um, pushed out of the birth canal, but either way, they're suctioned, so we get rid of all that fluid. How can suctioning impact breastfeeding? What it can lead to is something called breast aversion. Breast aversion means an extreme dislike of the breast. And if you think about it, if a baby is just born into this world, you know, they've been floating around amniotic fluid for nine months, and then all of a sudden they're, they're born, and someone comes and takes a suction, mm, suctioning their nose and their mouth and really aggressively, it's not very pleasant. And then right after that, they put the baby on the breast. The baby associates the breast with that really unpleasant suctioning experience. And then every time that mom puts the breast in the baby's mouth, the baby is really has an aversion. Oh my God, what is that? And they push away and they become extremely fussy and that kind of situation makes it really hard to breastfeed because mom will go to breastfeed and then instead of having a baby that's eating, baby is pushing away from the breast. And really mom often feels rejected. Breastfeeding is not gonna go very well. So what about weighing, measuring, and bathing the baby immediately after birth and breastfeeding? So first of all, let's ask why are babies weighed, measured, and bathed? Well. They're weighed and measured because that's a great way to follow the 
trajectory of the baby, their normal growth and development. Typically, um, every time a baby goes to the pediatrician's office, they're going to weigh and measure them because they want to make sure that they're growing adequately. A baby that is born at a 20% height should be 20% height at each of their subsequent visits. Same with their weight, the head circumference. And so this is a gauge that if the baby suddenly has is not following that same pattern, there's a concern. Um, why are they bathed? Well, they're, you know, there's a lot of fluids and a lot of things on babies, so we clean them. Uh, now, when these practices are done immediately after birth, how can it impact breastfeeding? Well, when your baby is weighed and measured right after birth, immediately, then this delays breastfeeding, and it can make it much more difficult for um, the mom to breastfeed. And so what we know about, about breastfeeding is that when moms get baby right away, within the first hour, uninterrupted skin-to-skin -skin care, that golden hour, breastfeeding is much more successful. Delays in breastfeeding have actually been linked to um, lower breastfeeding success. And when we talk about bathing, actually, there is a lot of amniotic fluid on baby. And if you're bathing that baby immediately and you remove that amniotic fluid, that makes it harder for babies to breastfeed because the amniotic fluid has a scent. It's very similar to the smell of that mom's breast milk. And it actually is a, a cue that helps guide baby if they breast crawl to the breast. And so if we weigh and measure babies and bathe them, it's fine. It doesn't affect breastfeeding, but then it's done right immediately after birth. It can delay breastfeeding. And as I mentioned, research shows that breastfeeding that's delayed results in much less successful breastfeeding rates. What about babies placed in warmers? How does that affect breastfeeding? Well, why are they placed in warmers to begin with? Does anyone know? That's right. Babies have a very difficult time initially regulating their body temperature. And so they're placed in a warmer to help regulate their body temperature. How can this impact breastfeeding? Well, just like taking baby and immediately weighing them and bathing them, putting a baby in a warmer immediately after birth, it's going to delay breastfeeding. And there really is no reason for it. When babies are placed in skin to skin care, they, um, their body temperature rises. Uh, it's really not necessary to put baby in a warmer. In fact, if babies are put in skin to skin care, their temperature remains stable. Mom's um, breasts, actually a lactating mom's breasts are at a higher temperature than when she is not lactating. And putting that baby skin to skin near mom's breast will um, help that baby's temperature stay stable. There's also a, a bunch of other benefits associated with skin to skin care, um, including it reduces infants crying, it keeps their blood sugar levels stable. Uh, we'll talk much more about the benefits of skin to skin care in the session on hospital practices that support breastfeeding. But in terms of putting the baby in warmer, basically this negatively impacts breastfeeding because it causes a delay in getting baby to mom. And it's also unnecessary because the, the mom's skin is just as effective, if not more, um, at helping regulate that baby's temperature. Now let's assess your knowledge on how hospital practices used during the postpartum period can impact breastfeeding. Which of the following describes the impact that suctioning may have on breastfeeding? A, edema in the extremities, including the breast and nipple tissue. B, impaired sucking. C, breast diversion. Or D, a baby who is uncomfortable breastfeeding in certain positions. That's right, breast diversion, you got it. 